Come and sing out the faith you found. Come and pray with the hope you have found. Come and rejoice at the acceptance you have found in Jesus, the Good Shepherd, the Friend, and the Savior. Amen. Good morning to you all. Welcome you to our Sunday service. And to, well, we hope you are going to enjoy the service and to lift up your spirit. Let us pray. As we come together as God's people in this place, we pray for those missing today, those who are ill, those who have other commitments, those who are struggling, those who are away. Loving God, touch each one of them with a sense of your presence and bring them safely back to us when they are ready. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would call Brother Ben to come and read the word of God. Good morning, family. What a wonderful Sunday it is. Uh, today I'll be reading about the golden calf and um, these crazy Israelites. <laughs> So Exodus 32, 1 to 14, the golden calf. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioned it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Israel. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. The Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have, them, have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the Lord's favour. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them up out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servant Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I'll give your descendants all this land I promised them and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And this is the word of the Lord and this week's message. So we'll get Johnson back to share what he has on this uh, Bible verse this week. Thanks Johnson. Thank you Ben for the reading of the word of God. Uh, Exodus 32, verses 1 to 14. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to come up with the theme, What is your golden calf? What is your golden calf? Have you ever waited for someone or something until you just didn't think you could wait anymore? Whether we are waiting for a letter, a text message, a phone call, waiting for a repayment to arrive, or we are the repayment waiting to be paid. Waiting gets to us. Waiting is a miserable experience. If you are waiting for a phone call, 
we pace the floor, ring our hands, and end up talking our frustrations out on the phone itself. Ring your stupid phone. The more important thing we are waiting for and the longer we have to wait, the worse it gets. Parents often have the miserable job of waiting on a weekend night for a child to come home when they've gone out with their friends. The agreed upon hour arrives, but the child doesn't. No need to worry. I'm sure she will be here soon. You will be here soon. After a few more ticks of the clock, the imagination kicks in. For some reason, parents always think their child is lying in a ditch somewhere. How many children actually end up in ditches? No matter, that's where our child is when he is or where he is let. Anger and worry arm wrestle each other for control of our brains until finally the headlights appear in the driveway and we say, oh, he's here, he's here, he's back. Think about it. What if your husband or wife or a child or a best friend leaves and goes on a business trip for three months? And for the entire time, we have no conduct. You don't even hear from him or her. No, I love you. No, I miss you. No, I will be home next week. No text message, nothing. Pretty soon the time gets closer to passing when surely he or she should have retained. And they are sure he or she has to come to good end. Let's face it. Love gives us no guarantees. Those of you in relationship like that know that love is a risk. Love is walking into the unknown, trusting in a relationship that you haven't yet even completely built. It's like contracting someone with someone to build, contracting something. It's like contracting with someone to build a house somewhere you have not even seen and picking up and traveling there. Just hoping that the house there when you arrive. It will be there. Look, either you're on your way to a file missing persons report, or you suspect he or he has started a new life with someone else secretly, or you come to terms with his or her absence and begin to take steps in a new direction. You begin grieving the loss and fearing the worst. For the sake of fairness, we have to say that youth do their share of waiting. As well, wait until you are older. Wait until next year. The months right before the big driver's license test drag by, the day never seemed to get there. Wait to get to college. Wait until you are a teenager to get a phone, a mobile phone. Wait to get to college. To be out on your own seems to take forever. It's, I can't wait that time to come. Whatever our age, we are just no good at waiting. It's a problem. So in our scripture for today, the Israelites are in that wilderness, on that journey from Egypt to an unknown place of promise. They are facing a lot of unknowns. They are also a bit unsure they want to get there. Let's face it. They take a two-week journey. That last, wait for it. 40 years. 40 years. So the people of Israel were not much good at waiting either. Moses, their leader, the one whom he had gotten them this far, was up, up to, in the mountain. So the people at the foot of the mountain were twiddling their thumbs, pacing the floor. Where was Moses anyway? What was taking so long? What are we supposed to do while we are waiting? Are we sure he's even coming back? Maybe their minds started playing tricks on them. They probably knew the story of Enoch. It was an ancient story. Enoch was one of the descendants of Adam through Seth. In a puzzling verse, the narrator tells Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him. In Genesis 5, verse 24. Maybe they thought that is what has happened to Moses. If that story means that Enoch just disappeared, maybe Moses just disappeared. If Moses went up the mountain to be with God, maybe God just took him. If so, he wasn't coming back. So the people of Israel might not have quite trusted Moses. Early on, before the confrontation with Pharaoh, 
even started. Moses tried to break up a fight between two Hebrews. One of them snailed at Moses. Who made you a ruler and judge of us? In Exodus 2 verse 14. So the story indicates more than a little sadness among the people. And it suggests that some of the Hebrews might have resented Moses. After all, despite the efforts to hide it, in Exodus 10 verse 12, Moses was an Egyptian name and yet been raised in Pharaoh's house. Surely the thought crossed their minds, is he really one of us? Remember Moses was raised up by Pharaoh and his name is not one of us. Is he really one of us? What has he gone wrong? Certainly the people were used to being janked around and lied to. Their taskmasters were cruel and Pharaoh had issued his order to have all of the newborn male Hebrew babies killed in Exodus chapter 1. So when the pressure was on, Pharaoh ordered the taskmasters to require the Hebrew slaves to make just as many bricks as before, but without giving them straw. In Exodus chapter 5, they had to gather straw and make bricks. Pharaoh lied about letting them go. None of this put them in much of trust in mood. Even after they escaped from Egypt, crossed the Sea of Reeds, things had been far from easy. They had been hungry, thirsty. In Exodus 16, they had fought nip and tuck battles. In Exodus 17, they had questioned whether the Lord was real in this war mess or not. To say they were stressed out would be an understatement. They were real people who were not sure of what is going to happen. So Moses' trip up the mountain had actually been a high point in their journey. Reaching Mount Sinai was an important milestone. Just before Moses left, the people were consecrated in a big ceremony. Everyone was in a worshipful mood, assuring Moses that everything the Lord has spoken will do. In Exodus 19 verse 8, things were going well when Moses went up the mountain. Then Moses stayed longer than anyone expected. The waiting got to the people. They seemed to have fed each other's fears. They all got anxious at once. When they went to Aaron, they went together as one body. No voice of reason seems to have emerged to try to blame, calm them down. If a voice of reason had tried to speak up, they likely would have shouted it down. So this was an angry group. In the waiting, in the frustration, all of the old insecurities seem to have popped back up. So the spirit that they had agreed to do what the Lord said when Moses went up the mountain seems to have wilted away. So the people were scared, anxious, restless, and angry. They wanted some reassurance, some security, something they could hold on to. If Moses was gone, that must make Aaron his brother, the new leader. So the people go to Aaron. What the people wanted was for Aaron to make gods for them. They did not so much want to change religions, but they wanted some security. They told Aaron, come make gods for us. Who shall go before us? Because Moses is no more. Exodus 32 verse 1. Their past had all full of betrayal, deprivation, needness, what was ahead of them was uncertain. So they wanted God's will to help them deal with their anxiety. They wanted a God to go ahead of them into the unknown. Notice that they are not turning their backs to the Lord. In verse 5, Aaron declares, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. So they convince themselves that they are still worshipping the Lord, but they want something more. Something more to worship God. So the problem with the Lord is that the Lord is intangible, isn't available on demand. So anxiety can make people do funny things. And what it makes the people of Israel do is worshiping their earrings. <laughs> Bring all your earrings. Take them off. Take them off. And they start worshiping their earrings. Aaron tells the people to take off their earrings and he makes a calf out of the gold in their earrings. Even the most primitive people should know better than to believe that their earrings led them out of Egypt. Nevertheless, they could see the calf. The calf was right there among them. 
Somehow that made them feel better. We've got something with us. We've got a golden calf. And he, oh, this is okay. So the problem with worshipping the real God is that God is free. We can't always see God sent in our lives right when we want it. God is under our control. That was the problem the people of Israel had. God wasn't immediately accessible at the beg and call. In their fear and excitement, they did not abandon the Lord. They distorted their worship of the Lord. They distorted the worship of the Lord. That's so much subtle. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. Life had been tough and who knew what was around the next corner. So they wanted security. They wanted security is not bad in itself. Even their earrings were not inherently evil. What made this episode so bad was that the people of Israel were trying to take away God's freedom. Trying to control God to make God do what they wanted. That is what was really bad. What do we want from God? Certain we live in uncertain times. With lots of anxiety and very little security. With COVID-19, we never know what to expect. In the back of our minds is the question whether today will be the day will be our last day on earth. We are not sure. Now we are experiencing economic problems that we haven't seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. How safe our jobs? A lot of people have lost their jobs. Will our life savings evaporate like the morning mist? How do we protect our children from society's preoccupation with the sex and infatuation with drugs? Will some clever scum steal our identity from our trash? We could go on and on with our list of anxieties, but that would just make us more anxious. With all of these threats hovering around us, God can seem far away. We don't stop believing in God. We don't change religions. We just want something we can hold on to. We want some insecurity, some security, something go before us into the unknown. People want something tangible. But I want to ask you, can someone touch COVID? Can you see it? Why do you believe that COVID is there? When you can't believe that God is there, who is unseen. But you believe that COVID is there. But you can't see it. You can only see the symptoms. But you believe it is there. It is high time you think about it. To say God is there. Even though you can't see. Him. That's when we open the door to idolatry. Idolatry isn't bowing down to a statue. It's not being secure enough to trust the unseen God with an uncertain future. Idolatry is being afraid to make ourselves vulnerable to God's future. Even if we don't quite know where we are going. We make ourselves vulnerable to idolatry. Our temptation to idolatry is not that we will cease to believe in God. It is doubting that God alone is enough. We doubt that I don't think God alone is enough. It is waiting to control God. To bend God to our wishes. We respond to our anxiety by creating idols in our lives. Because we think God is not enough. We turn the wisdom of investing money into the idol of trusting money. We turn the responsibility of doing our best into the idol of success. We turn the call to understand our faith into the idol of demanding that everyone agree with our theology. This passage makes clear that idolatry is not always an individual thing. The people of Israel go to Aaron together. Their anxiety was a community anxiety. Their idolatry involved the whole group. The world as a whole experiences anxiety. We worry about the health of our nations during this COVID time. We are so worried. Everyone is worried. That worry can open the door to idolatry. If an innocent hearing can become an idol, so can the necessity of national defense. We can place our trust more in our strength. Our military might, our weapons of mass destruction can then we do in God. Each nation can become arrogant about their status in the world rather than grateful to what God has done for us. In Psalm 20 says, some take pride in chariots and some in horses, 
Our military muscle can become a kind of idol. I know how hard it is for some of us to hear that. Our military protects us. Soldiers risk their lives for our safety and freedom. I don't understand that. But anything can become an idol. And we always have to be careful. As needful as our militaries are, we cannot allow them to become our idols. We have to trust in God more than in our fighting ability. We need to trust God. So God says in Exodus 32 verse 8, In sadness, they turned aside from the way that I enjoined upon them. God feels they have deserted the covenant. God feels alienated from them relationally. They have for, for God trust and have created instead a substitute for God. Because they couldn't trust in God's love, which they deemed not enough without a golden idol. They can't believe God is enough. So the way of God is trust. The kind of trust that means to commit in the dark. To keep trusting even when you can't feel God. And even doubt where God is there. You need to trust. God knows our anxiety. With Moses' persuasion, God forgave the people of Israel for the golden calf. Eventually, the people set out on their journey. Again, walking into the unknown. God forgives our acts of unfaith when we clutch to some idol because of our insecurity. Not only does God forgive our idolatry, but also God gives us courage for anxiety. We do not know the future, but we trust that God holds the future in divine hands. The people of Israel wanted God who would go before them. We have a savior who went before us. We even told Moses when they were looking for water, to say, go at that rock. You'll find me there. So it's the all our Lord who is always who always goes before us. Our Lord Jesus went before us to the cross. Christ not only provides our salvation, but also teaches us how to be vulnerable. In Christ, we can trust in God's future. Even if it seems it has to us, we get no guarantees that everything will work out well the way we want it to. We only get the assurance that God is with us in the journey. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God has shown us grace in Jesus Christ. God is with us through the Holy Spirit. In this time of anxiety, in our fears, let us not seek God in the golden calf. Let us seek only God. All of history and what lies beyond history are in God's hands. God is faithful. Let us trust in God. He is faithful and is there for you. We as followers of Jesus and children of God bear the holy image of God upon us. We have got the image, born in the image of God. What idol do we need when we are born in the image of God? All of us, we are God's engraving of love and commitment upon our hearts and our minds. We don't need anything further than we are the image of God. So may the good Lord help you as you move forward as Christians, not to worship idols in any harm. Yes, you can have money. You can have anything in the world. But never put money before God. God first. That's why Christians, we are reminded always to give our tithe. It reminds us that God first and we come later. So when I tithe, I, I'm just being reminded in my life that put God first in everything. May the good Lord bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Father, it is to, bl is to blame others when happiness goes missing. It is, is to blame the church when faith goes missing. It is, is to blame colleagues when fulfillment goes missing. It is easy to blame teammates when success goes missing. Lord, forgive us when we do not take responsibility for our lives and our actions and blame you and others. Help us to make changes where we can and to accept ourselves and others as we truly are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I would ask every one of us to take our offerings and tithe. And then we bring it and I will pray for it. Then it's, it's up to you.
to take it to the bank or you can even deposit through uh, your phones and other, th other gadgets you have. Let us pray for our time. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for giving us this opportunity that by giving our tithes, giving our offerings, we know that God first in our lives. We know that without God, we can't have all these things that we have. But because as we offer our tithes, they just remind us that God is the one who has given us everything. That God should be the first in our lives. That God needs to be given his first place. Bless this offering, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.